Uh, welcome everybody. Good morning. I think uh, we'll just begin our seminar today uh, with the Katakina. Chuk Talamai Iroga, Chuk Talamai Iraro, Chuk Talamai Iroka, Chuk Talamai Iwaho, Kiatoai, Te Moritu, Te Moriora, Kite Katua, Pumie, Uye, Tai Ue. Uh, welcome everybody, and we're very pleased that you could join us today. And we have, I think, 17 people uh, online here today, and some are part of our CTR team, and others are guests with us today. So we'd really like to welcome you all. And I wonder if uh, if we couldn't just have a little uh, Fanona Tanga and have people just introduce themselves. And uh, yeah, uh, just to begin. So I think to make it as smooth as possible, I will uh, call people's names. And if you could just unmute quickly, maybe say your name and uh, what brings you uh, to our session today. So uh, why don't we start with Zach? Welcome, Zach. Right, Zach, if you could unmute if you're there. Okay, we'll give him a minute and switch to, uh, let's go to Amanda. Uh, Morena, everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Amanda. Uh, I teach ethics in the faculty, but also I'm here really because I'm a PhD student and I'm looking uh, particularly at ethical conduct within teaching and learning research, particularly interested in the students' perspectives of ethical conduct. And so uh, the presentation is uh, really exciting because it's sort of down a similar, a similar track. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Anja. Morning, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Anya. Um, I recently started working at AUT. So um, any seminars, any presentations that I'm getting invited to at the moment, I love to join just to find out a little bit more about the faculty and um, introduce myself and um, get in contact, uh, interact with my fellow colleagues a little bit. So yeah. <laughs> uh, welcome, Anya. Thank and you. Uh, are you in the biostats? I am. I am. Uh, fine, yes. <laughs> excellent. Well, you come highly recommended, Anya. I said, uh, oh, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, welcome to our seminar Thank today. Uh, and Aisha. Uh, Morena, everyone. Um, I'm Aisha from the Business School. I sit in the Department of Finance. Um, and I'm here today because the alternate was attending a uh, climate Zoom. <laughs> and so it was climate finance or um, or this presentation. And quite honestly, um, to why I always learn so much whenever um, you present or speak. So it was a no brainer. So thank you for um, yeah presenting today already. <laughs> I know that I'll, I'll learn something. Uh, thank you, Aisha, and uh, congratulations on your webinar that you had about uh, economic abuse. It was very good. So uh, thank you for uh, passing along the, the invitation to that as well last week. So thank uh, you. Yeah, and thank you to anyone who, who attended. It was a yeah big success. Great. And uh, Chris, Chris Cowley. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, Oh, am I muted? No. No, I'm all good. Beautiful. Um, kia ora koutou. I'm Chris Cowley and uh, I work alongside Jane and the team um, since May of this year. And I'm working as a research officer in the violence intervention program for DHBs. And um, I'm here because T.Y. is a fabulous woman who I just can't wait to listen to. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Kitty. 
Morena Koto, um, ko Kerry Hunter Toko Ingoa. Um, I'm a PhD candidate um, in, in the health sciences um, at AUT. So just currently at the stage of putting together my ethics application for my um, police research. Actually, and I'll be interviewing Fano Māori who have experienced mental distress and police interactions. So I'm assuming that today is going to be totally relevant for me. Um, kia ora. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, Kitty. And uh, we have ML Jones. Uh, yeah, more than a I was just trying to change my name. It's Mark. I'm Mark. Hello, here. Mark. <laughs> Uh, from uh, I, I lecture in outdoor education in the School of Sport and Recreation. So I and I'm in it, but I'm also a PhD candidate, and so I'm doing my research with a decile one school, very very high in Pacifica and Maori. I just thought this would be relevant. Kia ora, welcome, and Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. A new lecturer just joined in the end of October. Nice to see some new faces and some old faces. Chris Cowley, I thought that was you from <laughs> DHB land. Um, I'm teaching in the violence and trauma area, so this is absolutely pertinent to the work they're doing and also probably looking for guest speakers. So TY, I'm sure I'll be in contact afterwards. So really looking forward to learning from you today. Welcome, Rachel. And Chip. Morena Koto, my name is Chen. I am a research officer in CITR and I'm here today to talk to Ko TY for this very important co papa that she's doing. It's uh, great. And yeah, go TY. <laughs> Thank you. Kia ora, Chen. Welcome. Arlene. Morena Koto. I'm Arlene. I'm working with Jane and I'm work and I work as an administrator for the research team and I'm here to your Tevai and uh, yeah Kiara. Thank you Arlene. Uh, Shona. Uh, kia ora everyone, I'm Shona, I'm a PhD student of Jane's. Uh, apologies if you get background noise, I've got a child in the room with me. She's on a Zoom as well, keeps asking me how to spell. <laughs> <laughs> If I look distracted, I might be, <laughs> but I, um, yeah, I really um, always enjoy TY's um, uh, presentation. So, yeah, looking forward to learning some more. Very good. Welcome, Shona. And Zach, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hey. Kia, uh, kia ora, Jane. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, Zach Morse from Clinical Sciences. Um, uh, well, our research and ethics and consent all come primarily from a very Western lens and Western point of view. So uh, we know, particularly Auckland, uh, Auckland, one and two Aucklanders were born from overseas. So there's many, many, many different uh, cultures in, um, in, uh, in New Zealand and in uh, Auckland. And uh, yeah, that brings uh, different uh, issues to, uh, to ethics and consent. Mm. Very good, welcome Zach. Glad you could be with us today. Uh, Karen Adams. Kia ora. Um, I, I wear, I'm new also to AUT and I'm okay. wearing quite a few hats. So um, I'm a research officer with Gate Lab working alongside Starship, um, primarily working with um, children with cerebral palsy, doing gate analysis on them. I'm also a research assistant on a, um, a research project for um, looking at new entrants um, in different DSL schools and looking at what their movement's like. So I'm a physiotherapist um, by profession and I'm also doing my master's in child health. Um, so I think pretty much TY's um, presentation is gonna cover all three of my bases. <laughs> so. Very good, welcome Karen. And uh, Nick. Morena. Oh, there we go. Um, Marina, I'm Nick Garrett, a biostatistician with the faculty um, and involved with some of Jane's research and a lot of Mary research as well. So just seemed very interesting. Uh, happy to have you here, Nick. And is it uh, 
it or it. Uh, kia ora everyone. Yes, it's ite. Um, ite. Yeah, well, it's it's my shorter version. So it's randilaite for full. Um, I'm actually from School of Public Health and um, lecturer within the School of Public Health. I'm doing some research right now with Pacific Youth and Sexual um, Health Education. So um, really interested to kind of look at Indigenous perspectives of youth and what they think around research. Um, we're also doing um, a research paper where we've de developed a Pacific research methods paper and ethics is also quite a big part of that. Um, so just interesting to hear what you have to say to why and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. Very good. Thank you. Welcome. Just a few more. Uh, Phoebe? Uh, Phoebe, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Uh, we'll go back up to there. Claire? Morning, everyone. Um, I'm Claire. I'm a research fellow in the CITR, and I've had the privilege of working alongside TY for the last few years and also to be Fano. So, always there for you, TY. <laughs> right and Lisa. Kia ora koutou, uh, morena koutou. Uh, I'm Lisa, Liko Lisa Mullions Takawingawa. I am here to support the CITR team uh, to Totoku uh, TY's uh, research presentation today and her kopapa. So, welcome everyone. Kia ora. And Phoebe, would, uh, are you able to unmute now? Seems to be flashing. Uh, it, have I missed anybody out? I just want to uh, say welcome to everybody. Uh, uh, Jane Kozio McLean, Tokoingwa, and I'm uh, part of the CITR. And I have had the honor of working with Tewai. It'll be four years in February. And uh, I think, as others have said, uh, what an honor it is to be able to work with Tay uh, She has an incredible uh, background in working with young people. And at the, at the center of that is her aroha and compassion that she has for young people and respect. And uh, she has brought uh, that to all of the research that she's been involved with on our team. And we're very uh, pleased to be able to uh, support her uh, in her mahi as she has transitioned from her master's uh, research and now working uh, on her PhD with Denise Wilson and others in the Body Research Center. So it is, uh, which, uh, with great pleasure that we welcome Tay Wai to share her corridor with us today. So uh, Tay Wai, if you'd like to uh, begin, maybe just with an introduction and, and then carry on with your corridor. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui ka koutou i tēnei ata. Uh, ko te wai, Barbara Jonasa, tōku ingoa. Um, I'll go through my whakapapa shortly, but I just want to say thank you all for being here and um, I really do hope that some of the kōrero that is discussed today really supports uh, any of your mahi um, that you're doing and thank you all for the tōtoko. Um, it's really, really uplifting um, and making me feel a bit more at ease. I do apologise if it might be a bit crackly at times. Um, it looks like there's some rain coming over the hunuas, which is where our cell phone tower is. So hopefully my internet stays fine. Um, but yeah, so I'll just share my screen um, and get into the presentation. All right, can, can everybody see that? Oh, I can't see anybody, hold on. Yes, we can see it, KY. Okay, kapai. So my research, uh, this is for my Master of Philosophy that I completed uh, in 2019. Um, and it's called Toku Reo Toku Toku Mana, which is my voice, my informed consent. Um, and my supervisors were 
Dr. Elaine Mikahiri Hall and Professor Denise Wilson. And I studied under Topua Wailda. So Kawaio, Moko Kirunga, Tamaki Kiraro, Mangatuoko Ki Wanganui, Parihauraki, Parewakato, Te Kaukauro, Pati Tere, Kitere Hene Hinui, Wakato Tanifa Rau, He Piko He Tanifa, He Piko He Tanifa. Ko Tauwhiri Te Maunga, Ko Wakato Te Awa, Ko Tainui Te Waka, Ko Ngāti Mahuta, Ngāti Pāwa, Ngā Hapu, Ko Tanifa Te Marae, Ko Potatau Te Whiruwhiru Te Tangata, Ko Wakato Te Iwi, Ko Te Wai Barberich Toko Ingoa. So kia ora everybody, I am Te Wai Barberich Unasa, um, I am a mum to a little two-year-old boy, um, I am a wife, my husband is of Samoan descent, um, and I live in a small beach coastal town called Kaiowa, uh, which is in the upper Hauraki area, I believe, um, on the Firth of Thames. Um, I am a research officer under CITR with Jane um, and doing some research alongside Jane and Claire, uh, Chen, um, Arlene and Lisa, um, and, and Chris. So it's really lovely to have my team here to, to support. I am also doing my PhD, um, I'm nearing the end of my second year, and that is looking at rangatahi experiences in the health service, so I guess at a later date I will be sharing about that and a wonderful resource that has been co-created with a group of rangatahi to, um, <clears throat> to support health practitioners uh, to, I guess, fill that gap in engaging with our rangatahi. All right, so starting off with this whakatauki, which is kapu te ruha, kahau te rangatahi, as an old net withers, another is remade. So rangatahi is a common term used within Aotearoa for young people, youth or adolescents. The meaning behind the kapu though is much more significant. And for my research, um, I use this well-known whakatauki, which is as an old net withers, another is remade. The whakatauki doesn't directly imply the idea of replacing an object with something that is worn out. More so, it speaks to the kaupapa or the topic of weaving our mātauranga, so our knowledge, from the older retiring generations into the younger generations. So that ensures our tikanga or our customs and mātauranga of te ao Māori continue to be passed on and it prevents the loss of traditions and customs. So this uh, whakatauki right here it opens my thesis and it is the guiding, uh, guiding whakatauki throughout. So what the literature says, informed consent is an agreement that, is ex that explicitly requires research participants to be informed about and understand the research they're potentially partaking in. Uh, manatangata, autonomous individuals, refers to individuals' choice to participate in research and their right to be appropriately informed of the mana to the manner of individuals or the collective. So um, there was, in my research, I, I done a, um, a chart to go through a prisma, a prisma diagram to go through all the literature. And I started off with about 3000 under my search strategy. And then as I went through the prisma, it dwindled down to 20 pieces of literature that were relevant. So um, my research is a kaupapa Māori research, um, and it looks at um, rangatahi views and experiences of the informed consent process. And so having a kaupapa Māori research, I use Te Aratika as a guiding tool to help develop and address the Māori ethical issues in research and around the decision makings um, <clears throat> for ethics committees. Um, so what they, how they use Te Aratika to support uh, current and future researchers to ensure that the, the research carried out is um, of benefit for our Māori, but it also aligns with tikanga um, and practices to ensure that our people are safe. Okay, so Te Aratika draws on foundations of tikanga Māori and is deemed useful for researchers, ethical committee members, and those who are involved in consultation or provide advice around Māori ethical issues from a wide-ranging perspective. Now, I can't um, push Te Aratika um, you know, any more than I can. It is a wonderful document. Um, it is an awesome guiding tool. And even years later, I still uh, refer to it quite often. Um, and I always 
ensure that I'm up to date because as we know, sometimes our our traditions and customs change with the times. And so it's always important to go back to our documents and really understand um, any possible changes and just to ensure that we know we are doing the right thing. There's a perfect tool, on uh, a perfect diagram on there that shows you how to effectively use it and it goes step by step. Um, so highly recommend that for anyone doing research that may involve Māori. Okay, so in recognising that youth are the key population to influence, it is essential that specific needs of youth are recognised, in particular Indigenous, and consideration given to young Māori within the context of their whānau, hapū and iwi if long-term changes are to be achieved. Now this quote is, um, it really hit home for me because it is very true. As a Māori, uh, we are a part of a whānau, hapū and iwi. Um, and ensuring that our rangatahi are not only identified as individuals themselves, but they are also part of a wider, wider iwi, which is really important to, um, to remember when we are working with our rangatahi. Okay, so my research question is, what are rangatahi perspectives of the informed consent process as a research participant? Now, I used a kaupapa Māori methodology for my, uh, my research, and that is basically for Māori, by Māori, with Māori. So it was the overarching methodology that guided and was instilled in every aspect uh, of my research to ensure the safety of our rangatahi, their taonga, or the treasure of the kōrero that they gave uh, toward the research, as well as myself as the researcher, to ensure that I was culturally safe. research objectives. So my objectives were to guide the overall process to make it beneficial for rangatahi Māori, understand rangatahi choices and participation within a research study, work collaboratively with rangatahi to ensure their voices are heard within an ethics context, and tailor a plan to support the informed consent process specifically with our rangatahi. So mātauranga is about handing down cultural knowledge previously learnt, and for it to occur within a research context, we must first identify how the informed consent process has been carried out over time and where it is today. So my overall aims of the research was to acknowledge and understand through a kaupapa Māori lens, the rangatahi perspectives about the ethical process of informed consent within a research study and to examine the reasons behind their decisions for participating in a study. Okay, so the community art process um, that as, as a bunch of uh, values, so community research values uh, that support any individual working alongside Māori. And so these have been uh, produced, in, um, produced by Fiona Cram and Linda Tuhiwai Smith. And so they, the community research values explain the importance of developing appropriate culturally based ethical research in response to a research that has predominantly been westernized and, had, and it has had a disadvantages or harming effect on participants or researchers. Um, so Fiona Cram, she summarized that the values explain uh, practices, well, they explain uh, the practices as a guidance for researchers engaging with communities and participants to both design and deliver Māori health research. And so the, these uh, community art research values were adapted uh, to ensure that my mahi with rangatahi was carried out in a manner enhancing and culturally safe manner. So basically, aroha ki tangata, a respect for the people. So the way I adapted these were to ensure that I was respectful to rangatahi um, as individuals themselves, uh, but also as a part of a wider whanau, hapu and iwi. So it was, I was ensuring that when we were organizing meet times, it was done mutually and in a place where they felt comfortable. So it's just um, initial actions like that can really um, determine how your engagement with our rangatahi are gonna be. Um, also, he hikitia, being a face that is known. So having those hui face-to-face -face rather than um, through email, through advertising of um, posters, et cetera, they are helpful to initially get um, the word around but ensuring that you have your hui face-to-face -face in a space that is comfortable for our rangatahi uh, is very important because it then opens up their mind to, okay, maybe I do want to be a part of this. Maybe this is something cool and 
they are wanting to meet with me in a mutual area that makes me feel comfortable. So these are some of the kōrero from our rangatahi. Um, again, these, these um, research values are quite important and to this day I still use them uh, to ensure that I keep myself accountable, uh, ensuring that my mahi with our rangatahi is um, safe and respectful towards them. Okay, so my participant recruitment. So my inclusion and exclusion criteria. So I aimed to recruit 17 to 15, or oh, sorry, seven to 15 rangatahi. Um, and for the research, for this research, I deemed rangatahi as being between the age of 13 and 17. Now I know that there are different beliefs of rangatahi being 12 to 25, but the reason why I chose 13 to 17 is to um, have a range of rangatahi that are in high school from year nine to 13 um, in Aotearoa. And so to qualify for the inclusion within the study, the participants had to be within their age range, um, self-identify as being Māori. And so that aspect of them self-identifying safeguarded my research approach and ensured that I remained kaupapa Māori. Um, and the rangatahi had to have previously been involved in a research study. And so that was um, a key element to ensure that they were able to draw on their experiences um, and provide kōrero through that way. Uh, and my exclusion criteria were rangatahi who, who were not able to um, voluntary, I'll give voluntary informed consent. So the school that I worked with was up in Auckland. Um, and they had a third of their students were Māori. So I, I had previously built a relationship with the selected school through my role uh, as a research officer. Um, and it allowed me to um, lean on that relationship to see how the school really worked with their, the research and their, um, how, what, how they accepted research within their school and how they recruited rangatahi. So that was a, an interesting approach in itself. So I knew that this particular school, they took up a lot of opportunity for various forms of research, many of which came from the government. Um, and it was at that point that I realized informed consent wasn't necessarily gained ethically. Um, so with this research, I did have a, a poster that was advertised um, and it was put through the newsletters uh, on their school site and in form rooms. And that was to ensure that all rangatahi had access to potentially viewing um, the recruitment poster. And the expressions of interest were obtained through, um, through assemblies and they would then contact myself. Um, and I carried out the recruitment at school through a hui. So we had a, a quite a few number of rangatahi that participated in that initial hui. Um, and it was a chance for them, for me to really go over what the research was about and have our rangatahi ask their questions before deciding to participate. And help holding that hui kanohi kanohi ensured that my, um, myself as the researcher became a familiar person to these potential participants. Um, and it created a form of whakawhanangatanga and it began to reduce any form of whakama or embarrassment for uh, that the rangatahi may have been feeling. Um, so ensuring that we have those forms of whanaungatanga is quite important. So finding those connections, we may not always be of the same ethnicity or culture or beliefs as other people that we work with, but there is generally always some form that you can, some form of connection that you can make, whether it be through sports, through the local area you're in. Um, finding those key connections is very valuable. Um, so at that hui, the information sheets were provided to rangatahi along with an assent form or a consent form based on their age. So I decided to um, continue on with the advice process from the ethics committee to have an assent form uh, for those who were under 16, um, and that will be discussed further down. So um, yeah, the, the rangatahi took those forms away and they were able to go back and talk to their whānau um, or their friends to decide if they wanted to continue on. Um, and then they were sent back to me. Okay, so my data collection and anal analysis. 
I used a focus group as I had one focus group with seven rangatahi, six rangatahi were 16 and over, one was 14. Um, and I used thematic analysis to analyze my, uh, the corridor that we're given. So the discussions were transcribed soon after the focus group uh, to ensure the accuracy of my transcripts. Um, well, to ensure the accuracy of my transcripts, I confirm these by reviewing the written transcriptions while also listening to the recording. So doing that, you know, I learned the literature of the data back to back. I was able to, um, it almost took me back to the initial focus group, being in that room with Arangatahi and hearing their voices again. So that was quite a um, an enriching process for me, uh, especially my first time doing solo data collection um, and analysis. Um, yeah, I, find, I found that to be quite beneficial. And then a copy of my transcript was made available to the rangatahi to, for them to confirm or alter what had been discussed. Um, and my kaupapa, so Kaupapa Māori helped guide the analysis and findings by strengthening the kōrero through a Māori worldview and weaving the various mātauranga shared. And that allowed the rangatahi perspectives to be highlighted considerably. Uh, as the researcher, of course, I brought my own philosophical stance, the research, while focusing predominantly on experiences in tikanga to steer the data interpretation. However, I was also very adamant that the data was in fact the current views of the rangatahi participants and not my own interpretation. And so again, that's why it was really important that I uh, continuously listened to the recording and went through the transcriptions. Um, and all themes and sub themes were generated from the data rather than preconceived from me as a researcher. So that allowed for an inductive approach to be utilized. Uh, and this ensured that the rangatahi voices drove the findings and that I was able to continually keep the rangatahi views at the forefront. So some of the themes that have come about were varying understandings of consent with the sub themes, permission versus consent, uh, making informed decisions and enabling the process. Uh, the second theme that came about were difficult decisions about not participating in research. Uh, and some themes were feelings to deter withdrawal and restating the right to withdrawal. Okay, so Rangatahi had different views when it came to understanding consent. A couple had no, had no real idea of what consent meant um, and others attributed it to giving permission. So for Rangatahi, consent is a process of giving permission by which one can understand the information so that they can provide their agreement towards a kaupapa. Uh, so a couple of the quotes that came about, nah, I don't know what consent means, eh? Just being honest. And yeah, like having our permission for something. So there were, um, generally, consent was referred to as permission, permission from our rangatahi. Okay, so when it comes to making informed decisions for rangatahi, they felt it wasn't as important to consult with their whānau for consent regarding research. Their priorities were more around sports activities, uh, which require money for fees, gear, and potential transport. Whereas with research, rangatahi believed as long as they completely understood the kaupapa and have enough information, then they would be more capable of making these decisions uh, and would bring it up with their whānau if they thought they would receive a valid response. Okay, so the hassle uh, as Rangatahi put it, the hassle of having forms signed by Fano really hindered the Rangatahi participation within research. So despite having considerable interest at my initial recruitment hui, um, it was viewed as putting too much work on for, for our Rangatahi. So by having these extra forms like Fano to fill out the consent forms for those under 16, um, it actually resulted in them throwing the forms away and not giving the research a second thought. Uh, so that's why um, I highlighted earlier, I had seven participants, six were 16 and over, and one was 14. Um, so having to do the assent and the final consent forms, it really impacted their choice to be a part of it because they felt that their final just wouldn't care. It's too much of a hoha for them to be going back. Uh, and they felt that they should have been able to have that right to sign for them, uh, sign for themselves, as opposed to having to go through that second step. Uh, so a couple of quotes from our rangatahi, we can do it, as in providing consent, they can do it themselves. 
And like, if you wanted to join so bad, but then your mum or dad didn't want you to join, then you'll feel disappointed that you're too young to sign by yourself. And that was really important. Uh, that was, yeah, quite a crucial turning point in this research to understand how our assent forms and consent, whānau consent forms can really impact the, the voices that are being heard and silence a significant minor, um, a, a significant uh, majority of our rangatahi. Okay. Oopsies. Okay, so difficult decisions about not participating in research. Rangatahi were very comfortable and open discussing their experiences of pressure. Uh, they experienced mixed feelings and emotions around the notion of being pressured into research, especially because they were Māori. So consequently, they had an inability to say no or felt they were replaced in situations where they could not say no. The remaining five rangatahi did not feel any pressure at all to participate in research. Uh, if they experienced pressure to participate in the past, they would feel empowered to hold their ground and do what felt right for them. And these rangatahi identified their participation was voluntary and at their own discretion without prejudice. So when this, although I ensured informed consent process was um, effective and valid to our rangatahi, when we came up with this, um, when this kōrero came up, it was important to reaffirm that, you know, if you don't want to answer a particular question, if you don't want to be uh, in the focus group anymore, that is kei te pai. So I ensured that I reaffirmed it all throughout our hui, um, just so that they felt comfortable and knew that actually I was there listening to them um, and I valued their participation and I respected their decision to be at the hui or not. So that's another important thing because otherwise you'll notice that rangatahi will just shut down. They won't feel comfortable. They will be, um, they will interact very minimal. Um, there will be body language signs that will show as well. And so it's just being mindful um, and having a look around and touching base with everyone to uh, ensure that they are okay and they are comfortable to continue on with the research. Uh, so some quotes that came about. So they, an organization, kept on asking me to join the research. And when I kept on saying no, they really wanted me to join since I was the only Māori at my school. Uh, and then I felt like in this school here, we don't feel pressured at all. You don't um, don't have like that weight on our shoulders uh, like other schools or other people might put on you. So these are two different experiences. One experience was at a at a school that had a large number of students, a very low Māori role. So that, that rangatahi felt that they were pressured to be involved in something they were, didn't want to be because they were the Māori. They had to represent that Māori voice. And putting our rangatahi in that position is really uncomfortable uh, and is not mana enhancing at all. So it was, and I, I felt very privileged that this rangatahi openly spoke about their experience because now we are able to provide, have written, written down kōrero, but also provide change uh, to future research to better support our rangatahi. Okay, so uh, recommendations for our ethics committee. So it's important for the researcher to reaffirm and explain to rangatahi that they can provide consent or non-consent and decide to withdraw from the research throughout the process, where it be at the beginning, halfway through, or towards the end. Um, so strategies are put in place to ensure rangatahi feel comfortable in all aspects of the research so that they can withdraw or participate freely uh, with answering questions. Information sheets should be kept concise and focused tailored to rangatahi age group to address their attention span. Uh, information that is more than two paragraphs can impact on what rangatahi retain and determines if they read fully what is provided. And lastly, uh, the importance of karakia. So a karakia to start and finish each engagement helps set a precedent for rangatahi and brings participants and researchers together as one. Uh, karakia in te Māori are very important. Um, it starts off our, our hui in a safe space. Uh, we feel guided, we feel supported. And then to close it with a karakia, again, it um, just solidifies all the kōrero and acknowledges uh, those participants within the research. Um, and, you know, just thanks them for their, 
for the kōrero and the tanga that they have given. And generally, um, just a little side note, so it doesn't always have to be a karakia either, just opening and closing with, it could be a poem, it could be a short kōrero, something that really um, acknowledges the rangatahi and the kaupapa. Okay, so recommendations for researchers. So have multiple focus groups um, with rangatahi because that promotes more points of view um, and the inclusiveness of our rangatahi from a wide range of levels. Uh, researchers should meet with the participants in a relaxed setting prior to any data collection um, to promote rangatahi becoming more comfortable with the researcher. So um, again, engagement, whanaungatanga, kanohi kanohi, um, and making those connections. Um, also, uh, is to explain the consent process in a manner that is easy for rangatahi to comprehend whilst avoiding research jargon that tends to cause confusion or easily misinterpreted by rangatahi. For example, um, consent. Consent was a very confusing word for our rangatahi. They, prefer, they preferred to use the word permission. Uh, so that is another possible change that could um, effectively support our rangatahi is the, use, the terminology used. And lastly, kai. Kai is very important. Uh, no matter who you're working with, kai is the... I guess the essence of connecting everybody together. So having kaya all the all the hui at, from recruitment hui through to your data collection hui and any follow up hui. It's um, it's a true language of many of our people. Um, so yeah, that brings me to almost the end of my my court at all. So does anyone have any part I? Oops, let me stop sharing. Thank you so much, Kay. That was brilliant. Uh, and I'm sure uh, it's stimulated a lot of thought. And I is, I'm thinking that we will have a lot of uh, questions. So um, let me see if I can go to gallery. And if anybody would want to put their hand up or unmute. We have a question from Ayesha Jane. OK, great. Uh, to why a non-research informed consent question. Do you think we place too much pressure on our students to go into post-grad studies? I feel like I'm guilty of this in finance as we need indigenous perspectives desperately to create the shifts we need. Good question. Thank you, Aisha. Um, it's really hit and miss, to be honest. It really depends on the school you're under, the faculty. There are we all know there are targets that have Māori. Um, and I've known that since high school, which is why I am where I am now. So a little back history is um, at my high school, they created a Māori form class. And when they did that, I was year 12 when they did that. Previous to that, we were all in mainstream form classes. And as soon as they did that, there was extreme pressure placed on us because we were the Māori who don't come to school, we um, we do what we want, we leave school at lunchtime to go to the shop and we're not gonna get far. Um, and th these kind of views, like over 10 years now I've been out of school and these views are still with me, those experiences. Um, and so we, as individuals, we tend to place a lot of pressure on ourselves to succeed and to beat these stereotypical views. Uh, and so I think when it comes to post-grad studies, as Māori, we, we are guided to continue on if we have completed, you know, the, our, our initial degree and uh, go, they want us to go on to post-grad studies. We are guided um, quite closely to continue on. Um, but I would like to say that it's not always the case. We don't always feel pressured. Not one time have I felt pressured to, oh, I've, I've got my degree, I need to go do post-grad. It was all my own choice. Um, I am fortunate enough, however, to once I started working at AUT, I was supported um, by Jane especially to, you know, if I want to do it, it's there. The, these options are there. We've got the support here for you. So there was never any pressure. However, I can't really speak for other faculties or schools, um, but I know that as a Māori uh, in the academic arena, we are, um, we're, I guess people come to us a lot for guidance and support, which then can place a bit of pressure to, oh my gosh, I kind of need to 
do for it to go further to ensure that I upkeep my academic records or my academic experience. So it is um, a fine line between the pressure, I, I would like to say, um, without being too blunt. Could, but if you feel that you are guilty of this, what makes you feel guilty of it? Um, or is it, are you genuinely wanting to support our people to go further? That, that's kind of something I would like to understand more. You might think it's guilty, but in natural fact, we might think, yeah, I've got someone backing me. You know, so when I went into my master's, I had Jane backing me. And it made that process so much easier and comfortable. And now in, in ending my second year of my PhD. So maybe that's something I'd like to ask you, Aisha. What makes you feel that you're, you feel guilty about that? I think it's also a little bit of uncertainty. So, um, you know, in finance, the reality is like, yes, postgrad will will get you a long way, but equally you can just go out and work in finance straight away. And so retaining our good students is awesome, but equally we know that um, our Maori students are mm. golden unicorns, you know, in finance. Um, it just doesn't tend to be a common major and I think this speaks to like a chicken and egg problem mm. is and you know unlike other business disciplines finance is so western mm. that it like it is a discipline that acts as its own natural barrier but we can't revolutionize it and make it less western without other perspectives so it's kind of like this ongoing dialogue but thank you for your answer to my question um, I'll let other people speak Cool. I hope I um, answered that correctly, but I'm happy to have a corridor with you anytime because I think that's, um, I guess I have no experience in the finance department um, and all the research I've been involved in has been Māori centred or kaupapa Māori. Yeah. So yeah. maybe another time we can have a corridor about it because I'd be really interested to know the dynamics of kaupapa yeah. Māori within your field as well. Yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Cool. Can we have a question, I think? you have your hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, kia ora te wai. Thank you for your awesome um, presentation. As you were going through, I was thinking, gosh, I can, I can relate <laughs> with some of the research we've been doing. And we've done a, um, we're doing a project at the moment with a school in South Auckland, and we've just done our youth talanoa. And um, I have a, a few thoughts, but I won't go over, I won't do all of them. But one of the things I... I did want to ask you was this this assent form and the the you know the permission from parents now obviously with my project we're looking at sexual health which is very um sensitive anyway <laughs> so when we did our ethics we just you know we had to just go 16 years and over because we wanted um our young people to feel you know like they had some confidentiality and be able to share I just wanted, I wanted to ask you about how you deal with that within um, Mataranga Māori in the sense of you want rangatahi to have their voice and to feel like, you know, they, they can speak unreserved, but you also have this connection with iwi hapu and thinking of that broader holistic perspective. And so I wondered, I wondered how, um, how you could, you know, what your thoughts were about making sure that you know you're still connecting the research and their voices with the whole whole fano but you're actually also privileging their point of view and not making them feel you know like someone is checking on them yeah cool good question thank you um and i totally understand how you've had to do research with 16 and over to mm. provide consent it is a huge struggle i find working with mm. our rangatahi um, especially when it comes to having to provide those assent forms. Mm. Um, it's a huge passion of mine is to um, ensure that our, our rangatahi can provide their own consent if they are under 16, um, because they are their own individuals. Uh, when it comes to um, under matauranga Māori, it is a tricky situation, uh, and we have a lot of hui about that. <laughs> um, but basically... What, so what I did to support uh, my research was offering that hui up to our whanau so that they can, yes, it is going to be awkward corridor, uh, but we, I guess we kind of know some, to some extent, what we, what words we choose, mm. you know, will really either hit home for them mm. or it will kind of 
I guess, drive them away. Um, <laughs> so offering that, offering that, uh, the hui with whanau, mm. talking with our rangatahi. So a, a question I asked in my research was, do you talk with your whanau about consent for this research? Who spoke to their whanau about my research? And there was only one. Mm. And that one was because they had to provide assent. And then, so we, we had a bit more of a corridor around that. And the parents didn't care. They were just like, yeah, whatever. Why do I have to do this? We're old enough to do it yourself. You know, and those who um, those who didn't speak to their fano, like, oh, why don't you speak to them? They're just like, oh, they don't care. Mm-hmm. They just, they know that if I want to do something, I'll do it. It's just when it comes to them having to pay money, um, they want to know because you know, it's, especially when it came to sports, sports was the hugest thing. They felt that they would take the time to sit down with their fano and discuss. Mm-hmm. Um, so when it comes to you know, especially like sexual health, a lot of our rangatahi aren't going to feel comfortable. Um, discussing sexual health questions or services with um, without their parents to some extent, mm-hmm. you know. So in my PhD, uh, what I've learned so far is that uh, when it comes to health services, our rangatahi want their mums there with them or an older sister mm-hmm. or somebody there to support them. So perhaps what needs to be done is having those hui, having a hui available, it, whether it be one-on-one or a group hui, um, or, or talanoa you know have that have that option there so that you can really discuss uh, the kaupapa of your research and make them feel comfortable and confident in their ability because you know previously uh, our people it's been quite tapu to to discuss sexual health or sexuality or anything but as the times are changing our tikanga is changing mm. and uh, our whanau are becoming more open uh, about these uh, about this kopapa, but within their fano, they are um, having more open corridor. Mm. So you might be surprised what you uh, what support you'll get if you do offer that kind of mm. um, Um And again, I guess when we are navigating mataranga Māori and te ao Māori, it's always good to hui with someone else in your field, get their perspective, see what their experiences have been. Mm. Uh, they they do provide quite a lot of knowledge and um, about their journey as well and so it can give you little ideas you might want to take bits and pieces and then create your own individual pathway Kia ora. That's probably thank one. you thank you for that i i, I had a, a one other question just uh, you don't have to answer it but just thinking with mm-hmm. with rangatahi you said you had focus groups um I, you know, I, I feel like a lot of us do focus groups with, uh, with with young people. I'm just wondering about interviews, you know, if there is that option sometimes or if it's better just to do focus groups. I guess it depends on the topic too, but, you know, whether, whether you thought about that and, you know, what you, what you had, to, what you had to say about it too. Yeah, yeah. So I, um, I opt for focus groups uh, simply because, as Māori myself, I struggle to have one-on-one. Um, <laughs> then um, when I've got other people around and they spark up a corridor, something yeah. will trigger me and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, then, yeah. and so that provides a sense of comfortable comfortability for our rangatahi. Yeah. Um, and also they just don't feel like you're just kind of eyeing them out. Like, yeah. you know, it's all about, um, well, again, we come from a whānau hapu iwi. We are always a collective. We have our individual perspectives and our individual thought processes, but again, we are much more comfortable in a group. So that's why I always opt for focus groups, mm. uh, just because I find that it, it, they feel safer. Um, it's comfortable for them, but they they can be themselves, yeah. as opposed to the stress and the anxiety that actually an interview does have on them. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So, uh, I noticed Zach has his hand up, and then uh, maybe if there's one other question after that, and then we'll close for the day. So, Zach? Kia ora tue. Um, you, were, you had kai, food, at the bottom. And actually, the word kai is uh, common throughout the Pacific. Um, I would say that food should be way up the list, right up at the top. And it reminds me of when uh, when we were doing research in uh, when I was doing research in the Pacific, we would have to um, present the chief with food and cover, 
right? What that's the that was the very 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 first step, and then we had to sit down, eat, and drink kava with with everyone, and only then could we do our research and so forth. Okay, and when I worked uh, in a Maori uh, community, uh, they soon uh, they soon found out that I love to eat fish for breakfast. I love to eat kenna, uh, sea urchins. I love to eat seaweed, and then it, we had a instant and a solid bond. But how to reconcile this with uh, Western uh, ethics, where we have to keep professional boundaries, where we have to, uh, you know, be mindful of power imbalances? It's mm. a completely diametrically opposed uh, worldview. How to reconcile this? Yeah, um, good question. A good corridor. Agreed. Um, and a lot of Pacifica Māori nations, you know, kai is very important. Um, in respect to te ao Māori, what we do is you have to have, uh, so you're in a space of like tapu and noa initially, and so you have to have that pōwhiri or whakatau process, um, which then releases you from tapu to noa, and then you have a kai to end that. Uh, so that's kind of why I guess a bit down was kai, but I totally agree, kai is like top of the list. Every Anywhere you go, you have to take kai. Um, in terms of... I guess managing the Western processes and the the te ao Māori processes, it is a fine line because uh, so an example I always say is for me I am a Māori who um, has to prove myself in a Western institution, but I am also a Māori who has to prove my uh, Westernized ideas in te ao Māori. So it's a tricky tricky space to navigate throughout life. Um, but one thing that I do know is having these uh, these various tools like Te Aratika. Te Aratika is amazing um, because our people have done the research to try and support the, I guess, the amalgamation or the connection between the two worlds. Uh, because obviously, you know, we have to ensure that what we're doing under the university guides is correct and proper but then for our own and our own cultures is another um, is another dynamic to, to get through. And it is a struggle. Like there is no one answer. And I don't know um, if anytime soon there is going to be the correct answer, if you know what I mean. Like it's just a tough space to navigate. And we learn through experience. We learn through hui. I'm big and um, I'm massive on consultation, talking with our people, talking with other, um, other academics, talking with kaimatu and queer, you know, so that we can come up with a plan. And this is what I've done through both of my research is to hui uh, with a variety of people so that then I can come together and ensure what I'm doing is of benefit to our people as Māori, um, but also to, I guess, under the ethical guidelines of a Western institution. So it's never going to be easy. We're never going to have, I don't know, the one best, best practice at whatever is, um I guess whatever is appropriate and applicable to your to your research or your field of practice yeah sorry I Joanna, think... oh, that's just great to have one. thank you so much today for sharing your wisdom with us absolutely incredible uh knowledge to hear what the Rangatahi have said uh within that safe space that you created uh so just uh, well done. Just absolutely amazing. And we, I really hope that ethics committees will listen uh, and, uh, and support some change into the future. Um, and I also think Reflect just is realizing the importance of Kai and with our Zoom meetings that we have. That's one of the big things that we're all missing together, isn't it? Uh, to have those moments of Kai. So uh, just recognizing what a loss that is for us in our communities. But anyway, a big thank you, Tay. Absolutely incredible research. We can't wait to hear more from you. Uh, and I'm wondering, is there someone who'd like to close with the Karakia? Uh, would anybody want to uh, do that? Otherwise? I'm happy to, Jane. Oh, Lisa, lovely. Uh, kia ora, kia ora, uh, 
te wai namahinui for that wonderful presentation. Uh, so, uh, me karakia tato. Tutawa mai i runga, tutawa mai i raro, tutawa mai i roto, tutawa mai i waho. Kia tau ai, te Māori tu, te Māori ora, ki te katoa, hui e. Thank you. Thank you, te wai. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I really hope you found that informative or found oh. a information that might work well for you. Fabulous. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you.